Good afternoon. I'm Alexandra Klitina, journalist of Kyiv Post. Today with us, Francis Fukuyama, political economist, uh, professor of Stanford University, writer. Good afternoon. Ah, oh, sorry. Good morning. I, I okay. guess it's quite good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> nice to talk to you. Uh, nice to talk to you too, and thank you for agreeing for this interview. Sure, I'm happy to. I, I'm a reader of the Kyiv Post, so I'm happy to do this. Thanks. Uh, my first question, of course, about the war in Ukraine. Uh, so what, in your opinion, the nature of this Russia's war against Ukraine? Is this a war of democratic war against autocratic regimes or the real goal of Putin just to destroy Ukrainian nation? Well, I think it's both. I think that... Um, he has specific objectives in Ukraine. He didn't like the fact that the Soviet Union fell apart. And so he'd like to reassemble as much of the Russian empire as, uh, as possible. But he also clearly doesn't like liberal democracy. And uh, he you know, has been supporting anti-democratic regimes all over the world. Uh, and there's one right on his doorstep. I think that Ukraine was always particularly threatening to Putin because Putin argued that, you know, for a Slavic people, democracy wasn't appropriate, that they needed strong, centralized, authoritarian government of the sort that he was providing. And as long as uh, Ukraine survived as a democracy, it uh, uh, undermined his narrative. And I think, you know, that was another reason why he uh, launched this invasion. Uh, I see, but can we compare actually uh, Putin to Hitler as uh, often media did? Well, I think that uh, there are many things about contemporary Russia that are very similar to fascist Germany. And, uh, you know, between uh, Putin and Hitler, there are also a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, he has really talked uh, and people around him have talked in genocidal terms. You know, he really wants to eliminate Ukraine as a people. Uh, and if that requires killing a lot of Ukrainians, you know, he's willing to do that. But he also would like to snuff out Ukrainian language, culture, any kind of separate uh, uh, identity. You know, he published that famous article uh, last year where he said that the Russian and Ukrainian people are one. And so he doesn't uh, accept the fact that Ukraine has a separate national identity. Uh, has its own traditions and has a right to its own uh, sovereignty. So for him, uh, you know, it's very similar to Hitler's attitude towards the Jews, towards Slavs, towards other, you know, non-German people. Uh, certainly in terms of the methods that Putin is using, it's very similar to Hitler holding these big rallies, trying to indoctrinate people, uh, using, you know, mass media to whip up, uh, you know, nationalistic uh, uh, support for the war effort. Uh, so in that respect, I think it's also, uh, you know, quite comparable to what happened in Nazi Germany. But they calling themselves anti-fascist. Well, look, it's, it's the misuse of language. Uh, you know, um, Putin is very good at projecting onto other people what he himself is doing. And so he claims that this is a defensive war to protect uh, uh, Russia from NATO aggression. And, you know, it's, it's ridiculous, but, um, you know, it's one of the things that he can say that will build support among Russians who are, you know, many of whom are now convinced that they're the ones under attack. Uh, you are famous for the title, The End of the History. So where are we now? Uh... At the which, uh, which cycle of the history at the moment? Uh, so Well, yeah, you have to realize that, you know, when I use the word history, uh, it was meant in this very long-term sense of progress in human institutions. And, uh, you know, my argument was that we were making progress and that the end of history was not the termination, but rather the goal or the uh, point, you know, towards which progress was heading, uh, which I uh, argued was not communism the way Marx believed, but rather some form of liberal democracy. And I think that you need to understand that we're in a, you know, this is a nonlinear process. We don't make progress every single year. 
and sometimes we have huge setbacks. Uh, and so we had a huge setback in the 1930s. We had another one in the 1960s and 70s. And over the last 15 years, <clears throat> there's been a lot of reversal of democracy in Turkey, in Hungary, in Venezuela, in Myanmar, in Tunisia, you know, a whole series of places that we thought were becoming more democratic. But, you know, history is not predetermined and it really depends on the actions that people take uh, in defense of democracy. And one of the things that I think is extremely admirable about Ukraine is the way that Ukrainian citizens have risen up to defend uh, their own society uh, against Russia. Uh, I think it's demonstrated to the rest of the world that there are people that want to fight for their freedom. Uh, they're willing to take risks and to die for that freedom. Uh, and it's a very inspiring uh, story to everyone uh, else. And I think if Ukraine is successful in uh, pushing Russia back, it will uh, you know, be a big victory for democracy, not just in Ukraine, but, you know, around the world as a whole. You know, Putin was the leading anti-democrat in the world. Uh, he and the Chinese were arguing that democracy was weak, it was ineffective, it was in the on decline, and now, you know, he, it's his society that seems to be declining. So, you know, for all those reasons, I think, um, you know, Ukraine is helping to push history uh, forward, if, if, you, <laughs> if you want to put it in those terms. Uh, so has history been uh, jump-started? Well, I do think that if, uh, you know, Russia is really forced to uh, back down and pull out of Ukraine, it is going to be a big boost uh, to democracy, you know, in other parts of the world. Uh, there are many people struggling against dictatorship in many different countries that are looking to Ukraine. And if Ukraine is able to resist uh, Russia in this manner, then I think uh, they will uh, be inspired by it. And uh, do you think uh, would Russia survive uh, as a state uh, in a case uh, if it lose? Well, I, I suspect that it's going to survive. Putin may not survive. You know, Putin's legitimacy is built around the fact that he's a strong man and that he can get things done and he's successful at using power. But, you know, what he's done is really uh, turning into one of the biggest uh, disasters that I can think of in, in you know, my lifetime. Uh, he's basically led to the destruction of his own uh, military. Uh, he has... Uh, isolated Russia uh, from the rest of the world. He's undermined the uh, economy in his own society. And I think that anyone that, you know, uh, is defeated in that, you know, stark away is gonna have a hard time surviving if his only claim to, uh, to power is uh, the fact that he's strong. Uh, if you demonstrate a strong man is weak, you know, he's, he's not gonna last very long. Actually, Russian uh, society is quite supportive to Putin's actions. Well, so far, so far. But I think that, um, you know, the sanctions are going to kick in over time uh, much more strongly than they have, uh, where it's going to affect uh, Russian living standards. I think that uh, many Russians don't appreciate the uh, degree of military loss that they've suffered uh, already at this point. Uh, and I think that, you know, once that begins to sink in, uh, well, also, I think the mobilization in Russia has uh, scared a lot of people because now for the first time they realize that this war is going to affect them. Uh, so all of these things, I think, over time will erode the kind of automatic support that, you know, a leader gets when he starts a war. Yeah, and it's been happening in the history with Russia's wars. Uh, it's uh, Russians not uh, actually forgive the leaders uh, losing the war. Well, that was true in 1905. It was true in 1917. So, yeah, I think that's right. Um, what would happen if Putin uses nuclear uh, weapons in the war? And uh, what is the probability of that? 
Well, I don't think it's likely. You know, nobody can rule it out because it is, you know, the one element of Russian power that gives them claim to being a, you know, a really big, great power. But I don't think they're going to use a nuclear weapon precisely because I don't think it's going to benefit them. Uh, I don't think it's going to turn the tide militarily. It's going to undermine what remaining support uh, Russia has uh, internationally. Uh, it's going to have a lot of bad effects in Russia itself because radiation is not something you can aim just against one country. You know, when you set off a, a, a bomb uh, that close to your own uh, territory. Uh, and finally, I think that NATO uh, has many options uh, in response to the use of a nuclear weapon. Uh, NATO does not have to use nuclear weapons itself, but I could see NATO being drawn directly into this war and attacking targets, you know, Russian targets, both in Ukraine and in Russia in response to the use of a nuclear weapon. And, you know, Ukraine is about to defeat Russia all by itself, but if NATO comes into this conflict as well, the Russians have no chance. I mean, they're not going to survive that. So I, I think that, you know, Putin is rational enough to make this calculation that the you know use of a nuclear weapon isn't going to help him. It's probably going to make his situation much worse. And that's the reason I don't think it's likely that he will do this. But why NATO would not interrupt uh, now, for example, to help Ukraine and to stop this war as soon as possible? Well, I think that you know NATO has been cautious precisely because of this nuclear issue. Uh, you know, if the escalation really seems to be coming from the NATO side, then the Russians are going to fear that, you know, NATO really is going to take this opportunity to go after them uh, directly. And, um, you know, that changes their calculation. Uh, whereas if all of the pressure is just coming from Ukraine, uh, you know, with NATO support, obviously, but, um, you know, in a more graduated fashion, I think they're much like less likely to exhort to extreme uh, a resort to extreme measures. Um, so that's why I think NATO has been uh, cautious. I think they're probably a bit too cautious. You know, I think, for example, that NATO should be supplying much longer range uh, missiles to Ukraine so that, you know, Ukraine can hit targets in Crimea and other places. Um, um, and, you know, very possibly that's going to happen in the future. I hope it, I hope it does. Yeah, actually, Ukraine just attacked uh, Sevastopol and Russian ships there, I guess, with uh, Western weapons. So there is some success. Right, right. Um, I would like to ask you also about Elon Musk. Uh, how come that one person became so powerful in a democratic world? And is there any risk associated uh, with this situation for the future? Well, sure, there's risk. I mean, there's a lot of rich people in, you know, in capitalist societies. Uh, Elon Musk is a very brilliant entrepreneur, and he's created several companies, especially Tesla, that are, you know, very very successful. So, you know, we want that to happen. But it's turning out that his political views are questionable, uh, and uh, in particular, he is in this. A compromised position where he has big interests both in Russia but especially in China in terms of selling his vehicles and for that reason you know probably doesn't want to alienate the, the governments in either place you know he's already uh, you know taken a Russian line in terms of pushing for a ceasefire and some kind of negotiation he's also taken the Chinese position on Taiwan uh, it's very bad if somebody owning, you know, one of the most influential media companies in uh, in the United States uh, starts uh, pushing these kinds of positions. Uh, on the other hand, I think he's got a big problem on his hands because Twitter is not making money. You know, I think it's made a profit in like one of the last eight years, and uh, he actually paid way too much money for it, and it's going to be extremely difficult for him to turn this company around. <clears throat> so I'm not sure that Twitter is going to exist in another year. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what kind of damage uh, Musk can do with it. Uh, 
in that period. Hmm. But Elon Musk, he's a successful businessman. Why would he invest in something not profitable? Would he need uh, just uh, to get some influence uh, by, by buying Twitter? Well, you know, there's a lot of oligarchs around the world that buy media companies, not because they're profitable, but because they want influence. But I don't think that that was actually his motive in this case. I think that he actually thought that he could make money out of this. Uh, uh, why he bought it? Well, he made the initial offer, you know, when the market was much, much higher. Everybody has declined, Facebook and Google, uh, Apple, you know, they've all seen big declines in their share prices since he made that offer. So that made him try to get out of the deal. It was too difficult to get out. And so now he's stuck with this thing. So I think, you know, it may have just been a big mistake in judgment on his part. But he made um, you know, such pro-Russian statements in Twitter. So do you think he influenced by Russians actually? Well, that's the story that's been going around that he actually talked directly to Putin uh, and Putin, you know, uh, essentially gave him these talking points. Uh, Putin's done that with other people. I think that, you know, Donald Trump was repeating a lot of Putin's talking points when he spoke after they had summit meetings together. Uh, so yes, unfortunately, I think that's what's happened. So in today's complex world of internet, access to media, Wikipedia, uh, the value of scholars and thinkers like yourself uh, been devaluated. Uh, is real intellect uh, been sus suspended by fake or artificial mm -hmm. intellect? No, I don't think it's been displaced. I think there's a, a different set of problems. Uh, <clears throat> you know, artificial intelligence has been used. Uh, the, the most negative aspect of it really has to do with surveillance. Uh, and China is the country that's taken this to the furthest extent where They've used the pandemic and, you know, uh, as an excuse to extend their surveillance of, you know, every single one of their citizens. And they've been, they're able to collect data uh, and sort through that data using artificial intelligence on a scale that no one has ever attempted before. And that potentially gives them a degree of control over their society that no totalitarian regime could aspire to, you know, in the 20th century. So that's, you know, that I think is, um, is scary. I think the threat to intellect and to discourse is really not coming from artificial intelligence. It's really coming from social media where, you know, social media grabs everybody's attention, but for, you know, 15 seconds. Uh, and it's very difficult to have a prolonged, you know, careful discussion. Uh, everybody is distracted. Um, you know, people's attention is uh, taken by, uh, you know, things that pop up on your phone so that you can't pay attention to one single issue for any extended period of time. Uh, and I think that's really the, the problem that we're facing. You know, young, young, younger people today, you know, walk around with a phone in their hands, you know, staring at the phone, not talking to each other, not looking where they're going, you know, and so forth. And I think that's the real, you know, problem with regard to intellect, and it's caused not by artificial intelligence, but by social media. Do you think uh, how long this war would last and uh, what exactly could end this war, in your opinion? Because I think a lot of people in Ukraine are interested uh, to hear answer on this question, so that's why I'm asking. Well, it's very, of course, very hard to, you know, predict the course of a war, I have been more optimistic right from the beginning about Ukraine's chances. And I still remain uh, optimistic for a number of reasons. You know, the morale on the Ukrainian side is much, much higher than on the Russian side. The Russians have basically run out of uh, equipment and manpower. Uh, and I think they're struggling to replace the losses they've suffered already. They're in a very poor strategic position in Kherson and in the south. Uh, and so I, you know, am expecting that um, Ukraine will at least be able to push uh, Russia to the other side of the Dnipro River, you know, in the next, uh, you know, in the next couple of months. Uh, uh, I, I hope that that's the case. And I think uh, that would lead them to a, 
real deterioration of their overall position in Ukraine, you know, by, uh, you know, by next spring. Uh, but like I said, you know, I, I can't see them to the future any better than anyone else. Uh, but I do think that there's ground for uh, cautious optimism with regard to the, you know, the future of the war. I see. Uh, are you working on a new book at the moment? Uh, no, at the moment uh, not. I just published, uh, you know, a book uh, recently that, by the way, will be published in Ukrainian, um, Liberalism and Its Discontents, but uh, for the time being, I'm I'm taking a I'm taking a break. Thank you very much for this short interview. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you.